Dear family and friends in Christ, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Holy Father, Heavenly Lord, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for this Reformation Sunday, opportunity to celebrate your word and your word made flesh in Christ Jesus. Help us each day to celebrate your word among us, to celebrate the truth that it brings. May we know with confidence that if we know you as Lord, that we know the truth, the truth that will set us free for all eternity. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, what a privilege we do have to come together in God's house to celebrate the Reformation. To celebrate the work that Martin Luther did in the church, the way that he brought about this change, that the way that he brought the Word of God to the people of God. For isn't that what we truly celebrate on the Reformation? We would quickly forget about Martin Luther if not for the fact that he took a language, a Bible that was in Latin, a language the people did not know, and he brought it to them in the German language, a language that they could speak and they could read, a language that now they too could see the truth as it was brought to them. What a joy to celebrate that truth. Not just to celebrate Luther himself, but that work that he did in the Reformation. Now, as most of you probably know, but just in case, a quick refresher on the Reformation. Martin Luther did this translation of the Bible in a castle called Castle of, of Wartburg. And if you are not familiar with Castle Wartburg, it's not necessarily a pleasant location. And certainly Luther's circumstances weren't pleasant. He was running from Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who had a price on his head. He was hiding out. He had been kidnapped, at least that's what they said, uh, by Frederick the Wise's troops, and he was hidden away in this castle Warburg. Here in the castle Warburg, an unpleasant drafty castle, he translated the Old and New Testament so that the people of God could read God's word. Now I'm sure you know that as Luther made that translation, what he was working from didn't just immediately come together. It wasn't as though he picked and chose, or and our Bibles today as we have them, we didn't just suddenly get those books, and it wasn't as though God dropped from the sky two golden ta- I mean, it wasn't as if God just dropped it from the sky, the, bo- the whole book of the Bible, all the books we have today. But it took many years among the people of God to see the truth of his word, to recognize that truth that was brought to them. It took many struggles, different bishops, church leaders, to wrestle with that, with the work of the Holy Spirit to bring to us what we have, the 66 books of the Bible today. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time, just I want to tell you about the background of of our canon, or the rule. Now that word canon, it's not the word C-A-N-N-O-N, the weapon that we shoot large cannonballs from, but canon is C-A-N-O-N. And canon, as I talk about it, is a transliteration. So what they did is they took the Greek letters, first they moved them into the Latin alphabet, then they moved them into our English alphabet. So basically the word is the Greek word canon, in our English letters. Kind of follow that? Well, basically it means rule or measuring stick. And so when we talk about the canon of Scripture, the 66 books we have today, those books that Luther had in his day, we're talking about a rule, a norm. The presbyters, the bishops, they went through, and they used a certain rule. And it was not their own, but it was, again, the Spirit working through them. And we'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But first, I want to tell you about the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament, we believe it came together sometime in the first century. As we have it, the 39 books of the Old Testament, we believe that sometime before 70 A.D., because 70 A.D. marks the fall of Jerusalem when the Jews were spread out or the diaspora. So we believe sometime before that, there was this council called the Council of Jamnia. This council, the Jamnia is the location. And at this council... It is said that the canon of the Old Testament, all the Old Testament books were closed. In fact, let me read to you the words of Josephus. Now, Josephus, he wasn't a Christian historian. He doesn't have any kind of uh, dog in the fight here. Josephus is just a historian recording what he saw. He was a Jewish historian, and he lived from AD 37 to AD 100. But listen to his words following that council in Jamnia. We have but 22 books containing the history of all time, Books that are justly believed in, and of these, five are the books of Moses, which comprise the law, 
and earliest traditions from the creation of mankind down to his death. From the death of Moses to the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, the successor of Xerxes, the prophets, who, the prophets who succeeded Moses wrote the history of the events that occurred in their own time in 13 books. The remaining four documents comprise hymns to God and practical precepts to men. Now those are the words of Josephus, a Jewish historian. And if you didn't follow all the numbers as I was reading there, and I can share that quote with you later if you'd like, it adds up to 39. It adds up to the 39 books we have today. Now, I need to pause for a moment before I move on to the New Testament and tell you how we got to that. Because there's those books that we talk about that are called the apocryphal books. Anybody heard of those apocryphal books before? There's, there's 15 of them, right? And, a lot, and I need to dispel a couple of uh, misunderstandings that are out there. First of all, if you were to turn back to Martin Luther's German Bible, the 1534 edition, not a current one, because you can actually still buy one today following his translation, you will find that Luther did, in fact, include the apocryphal books. Fifteen books that were not included in the Old Testament canon, but Luther did include them. And that's important because I know there are a lot of false teachers out there who say Luther made this decision all on his own, and he cut out 15 books of the Bible just like that, but that is not true. In fact, not only is it included in Luther's Bible, 1534 edition, but those books, those 15 books, were also included in the King James Bible, the earliest King James Bible, and down quite a few years. It was not until much later that the laity actually pushed for the removal of those books. The people of God wanted those books removed because they understood those books to not be the inspired word of God. And that is the third truth I want to share with you about those apocryphal books. While Luther included them, he did not treat them on the same level with the rest of Scripture. He included them as an appendix, as an add-on, so that the people of God might learn from them, so that they might grow in their understanding, get a historical context, because that is what they mainly are. But Luther did not have an agenda. It was the work, and it was no secret move by the church to remove them. It was the work of the laity, the laity coming together with the clergy, recognizing that these books did not belong in their Bible. In fact, it's only been within the last about 200, 300 years that those books have been removed from most translations of the Bible. In fact, I encourage you to go back, if you can find some of those older Bibles in the library, and it's going to be a little bit hard, but to look and see at the list of books in there, and you'll find that those apocryphal books were included. Again, those books we treat as historical. They help us to have a better context of God's Word. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the New Testament as well, the coming together of the New Testament, because it came together quite a bit later. In fact, it wasn't until about 393, there was this council in Hippo, northern Africa, and then a, in 393, followed by a council in 397 in Carthage, again, northern Africa, that, these, that the list of books as we have them today in the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament came together. Now, it's true, though, by the, about the second century, so not so long after Christ, that already we started to have a list of books to make up the New Testament. But it wasn't until these councils in 393 and 397 that we had an official list. But let me tell you, it wasn't as though these presbyters, these pastors, these bishops, that they just kind of chose the books that they liked. It wasn't as if they sat down one night and they had a couple of darts and they threw them at the dartboard and said, we'll include Mark, but oh, we missed on Luke. No, this was a very serious process and let me read to you a, a quote by F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. F. Bruce is a leading scholar in the New Testament. Uh, you'll find many, if you're doing any research, with his name on it, uh, many uh, works. One thing must be emphatically stated. The New Testament books did not become authoritative for the church because they were formally included in the canonical list. So in other words, it wasn't because they were included that they became authoritative. On the contrary, the church included them in her canon because she already regarded them as divinely inspired, recognized their innate worth and generally, and, and generally apostolic authority, direct or indirect. The first ecclesiastical councils to classify the canonical books were both held in North Africa, at Hippo Regius in 393 and at Carthage in 397. But what these councils did was not to impose something new upon the Christian communities, but to codify what was already the general practice of these communities. Pretty neat, isn't it? We see the Holy Spirit at work. And just to kind of boil down 
F.F. F. Bruce's quote there. His point is that this council basically just agreed with what was already true, what the church as a whole had already been practicing and what they'd already been believing. As I say that, though, I have to make a clarification because there was a reason for these councils. And that's a heresy that we're going to talk about today, the her heresy of Marcionism. See, Marcionism was this, well, it was started by this church leader by the name of Marcion of Sinope. Now, Marcion was a church leader. He was a wealthy church leader. He had done well with ships. He owned various ships and had done well in the shipping business. His dad was a bishop. In fact, he was the bishop of Sinope. But Marcion had trouble rectifying the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, with the God of the New Testament, Jesus. And just for a moment, as we think about it, how often have we heard people express that same struggle? The God of the Old Testament, he's wrathful, he's mean, he's vindictive. The God of the New Testament, Jesus, he's comforting, loving, compassionate. And we hear this sometimes even among Orthodox Christians. This struggle to rectify, to, 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 to wrap our minds about how God could be one way in the Old Testament and another way in the New Testament. I think if we actually read the entire scripture as pointing to the cross, we see very clearly that it is the same God. But not everybody does see that. And certainly Marcion didn't see that. So Marcion, pretty early on, well, he came out with this Marcion, Mar Marcionism. And those who followed him were called Marcionites. And this Marcionism actually was, well, it sounds kind of like Gnosticism. Because he had this idea of a supreme being he had this idea that of the demiurges, remember the emanations, those who were basically uh, came from that supreme being and all of them were sub-gods underneath. Except he didn't follow the same track as the Gnostics. Instead, he said, instead he believed that Yahweh was this sub-god. That Yahweh of the Old, God, Old Testament, who was mean, nasty, vindictive, jealous, wrathful, that he was this sub-god. And that the supreme being had sent Jesus, his son, into the world to redeem the world. Ooh, you can see how that almost sounds Christian, huh? Well, like the Gnostics, they actually fell into that. He actually fell into that same docetism. Anybody remember that? That's okay. Docetism, remember, comes from that Greek word dokeo, to seem like. So he didn't believe that Jesus actually was in human flesh, but only seemed like he was in human flesh. Well, Marcion fall, fell into that same thinking, that same view. So even when he believed that Jesus came into the world to redeem the world, he didn't really believe that it was fully God coming to the world. And so this shaped the way he put together Scripture. This shaped the way that he put together his rule, his canon. In fact, his is one of the earliest canons we have. But his canon was only made up of 11 books. The Gospel of Luke and 10 of Paul's ep epistles. He didn't include any of the other books, none of the Old Testament books. He didn't include most of the New Testaments. His favorite book was Galatians, although if you were to read Marcion's Galatians, it's a complete restructuring, a changing around. In fact, if you were to read Luke, his version of Luke, or any of his epistles, if you're looking for an Old Testament reference, you won't find it. If you're looking for a positive comment on Judaism, it's not there. See, Marcion, he changed the Bible to fit his worldview. It's not as though he didn't believe that there was that God of the Old Testament, Yahweh. It's not as though that he believed that the Old Testament was a fabrication, but he believed those were evil. He believed that those were not the teachings we were to follow. And so he came up with this 11-book canon. Now you can see, hopefully you see right away the problem there. Because Marcion, instead of trusting the truth of God's word to guide his life, he imposed his own view on God's word. He made God's word his word to fit his agenda. And sadly, Marcionism caught on. For quite some time in the Roman Empire, Marcionism had a foothold. People, good, what we would call good Christian people, they bought into this. For the exact struggle I mentioned. The God of the Old Testament, he sounds mean and nasty. He doesn't sound loving and kind like the God of the New Testament, Jesus. Thanks be to God that by about 500 A.D., Marcionism was put to, get, put to rest. But notice, that was still about 100 years after these councils had established that 
that true canon. And I make this point to you today. Because while there's not a lot of people who call themselves Marcionites today, in fact, I think it'd be hard to find someone who actually calls themselves a Marcionite, we certainly see where people play fast and loose with God's Word. Where they treat certain parts as authoritative for their lives and other parts that are not authoritative. Where they look at God's Word and they break it apart and they use their own judgment, their own opinion to decide what is most important and what is only intended for those first century Christians. Certainly not for us today, after all. And so while, they don't, while there are those who do not call themselves Marcionites, we actually see this quite prevalently, even among Christian people. You know, I sometimes get opportunity to be with some of you all out in public. And some of you have been asked before, well, what makes you different than those evangelical Lutherans? Now, usually the question's referring to the ELCA, right? The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we're the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. But have any of you been ever asked, asked that question? What makes you different than those evangelical Lutherans? Well, it's okay if you don't raise your hand on that. But, you know, what I usually hear the answer is, the very first answer, maybe the last answer, most answers are, well, we don't ordain women. Heard that one or two times? Well, there's some truth to that. But, you know, our difference is greater. A and we'll talk about sometime, honestly, we'll talk about ordination of women, but that our difference is greater than that. And I don't want to further a divide between church bodies if this wasn't important. Because the know, Lord knows there's already divisions in the church. Satan has done a wonderful job, sadly, of sowing seeds of dissension. But I bring up this point because it is our view of Scripture which is different from the view of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Our view of Scripture is that it is God's inerrant word to us. In other words, it is God's word without mistake, without problem, that what we have, no, so maybe there's a comma that's different here. Maybe there are certain words that are in different orders as it's been passed down. But we believe that the truth of God's word as it was given original context is still true for us today. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America does not hold that same view. And there are other church bodies who do not. They treat God's word with what's called the higher critical method. They treat, they treat it with textual criticism. And this textual criticism, it started out as a good thing. There's this guy by the name of Mo Winkle. That was his last name. He kind of has a fun name, right? Well, Mo Winkle, he wanted to understand the situation that David was writing the Psalms from. He wanted to understand what, where David's heart was, what was going on with David. So he came up with this whole idea of trying to study and reverse engineer the text. So he wanted to take these Psalms, uh, Psalm 46, for instance, the Lord is my refuge and strength, and figure out well, where was he coming from? Well, that's good. We should certainly study God's word, certainly learn the context of God's word in the original readers as we see it in our own lives. But it went further than that. Textual criticism went, took off from there. And instead of trusting God's word as truth, it started to call into question all the things in God's word that we couldn't explain. It started to call into God's word all these things that, that didn't make sense. So we come to Paul's writings, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, on, 11, on the Lord's Supper, and we read about Christ truly being present in the Lord's Supper. But that doesn't fit into our modern thinking. So that's questionable. The story of the creation. Six days, seriously? It takes us, sometimes hundreds of men working day and night, to build a skyscraper and usually takes about a year. God did it in six days? And the world, and the universe, is certainly greater than any skyscraper we have. It throws into question even our salvation. How could the Lord of the universe wrap himself in flesh? See, this is the danger. It's not just a small, willy-nilly thing. Well, we're picking on a little difference we have with another church body. The reality here of this truth is that it is consequential to our faith. It has major consequence to our faith. Because there are certain things in God's Word which we do not understand, which no matter how long, if we were to able to live as long as Methuselah to 969 years, we still wouldn't get it. There are things that God expects us to trust by faith. 
And one of those things is the message of salvation. The promise that Jesus did in fact wrap himself in flesh. That Jesus did in fact come down to this earth. That he did give his life on the cross for all of us. Listen to Paul's words in Romans chapter 5 because this is where, where it leads to. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. It's just a couple of verses later. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. We can't explain original sin. We can't explain how it has poisoned every person. Nor can we explain how Christ's redemption has given us forgiveness. But we know it to be true. And we know it to be true because God's Word tells us its truth. When we start picking apart God's Word, we lose that assurance. We lose that promise. If I were to stand before you and hold up my Bible and I just started ripping out the pages I didn't like, some of you would be highly offended. Actually, I bet most of you would be. Some of you would walk out the back door of the church if I picked up a Bible in that, wouldn't you? Why do we put up with it for when people do that? Maybe not literally, but figuratively. When they tear page after page out of the truth of God's Word. We as the people of God, we need to hold to the truth that God has given us. We need to uh, celebrate that truth. And we need not only to learn it, but to memorize it. Because there are a lot of false teachers out there today that are not only subtracting from it as Marcion did, but there are those who are adding to it. There are those who are adding to it, who are adding lies, different ways of salvation, different truths that are contrary to the truth of God's Word. And we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to face those lies because they are out there. And sometimes they sound really close to Christianity. In fact, some of you, I'm sure you watch the History Channel or you watch the Discovery Channel. If you watch some of those programs, they'll get scholars on there to talk about the Bible sometimes. Anybody heard of any of those History Channel presentations? Well, they'll talk about the Gospel of Thomas. They'll talk about the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, to name a few. And they'll talk about these so-called Gospels as if they're on the same level of truth as the rest of God's Word. Well, let me tell you a little bit about those so-called gospels that they try to add to God's word. Those so-called gospels from the beginning were called pseudepigraphal. Pseudepigraphal. That's made up of two Greek words. Pseudes is the first one, which means false, or actually I like the better definition, of erroneous and deceitful. The second word is grapho, which we often translate to write. It's the root of, if we, you see in the New Testament, writings, that's the root, is that grapho. So Pseudepigraphal is deceitful writings, false writings, erroneous writings. And the reason they're called that is because what these authors have done is they've taken the names of people with authority. So they've taken the name of Judas or Thomas or Mary Magdalene. So take note, Thomas, Judas, Mary Magdalene, they didn't actually write these Gospels, so-called Gospels. These later authors took on their names, saying that they were to try to gain authority. The problem is, and I challenge you, you can open any one of these Gospels, go to the Internet. There are English translations of these Gospels online. But what you'll read in those Gospels, if you know the truth of God's Word, well, you will realize right away is the opposite of God's Word. It is false teachings, and it is sown there by the devil. Let me give you an example, one of my favorite ones to give out when I talk about these Gospels. It's the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas, it talks about the way of salvation. Now, we know the way of salvation as Christians, right? Through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Gospel of Thomas says that if you are a woman, you have to become a man. You have to become a man. Hmm. Does that sound Christian to you? It doesn't to me either, especially when I think of Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where, where it says that where there will neither be slave nor free, uh, neither Greek nor Gentile, or uh, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, but all are saved through Christ, right? Yeah, that's, that's the Gospel of Thomas. So I encourage you to read it because I have nothing to fear from you reading those books. In fact, if you read them, you'll know the lies that are there, the false teachings that are there. 
But if you are going to, make sure you have the true word of God next to you so that you can compare what those lies say, what those false teachings say. We're warned by God that those false teachers are going to come, that those false teachers are going to come and try to lead us astray from the truth. And we need to always be ready. In fact, Paul says to us, and, and I love this, because he reminds us of how important Scripture is. And This is as he's writing to a young pastor, Timothy. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All of Scripture, those good words of God, they prepare us to go into battle against the lies, the false teachers. Those good words prepare us for the righteousness of God. Those words of God, all Scripture. Like I shared with the kids this morning, some of, the, some of those passages, they don't make sense to us. Not right away. But then when we read them in the context of all of God's Word, we see that it is God's story of salvation pointing to the cross time and again, the place that will set us free. That the Gospel of God is an eternal truth. In fact, when you think about Paul writing that to Timothy. Keep in mind the scriptures he had in mind. He wasn't thinking about the New Testament. Though those weren't all done yet even when he wrote this book. He was thinking about his own training. The Old Testament. He understood that the Old Testament still was important even with the message of the Gospel. Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah chapter 40 that we're going to die the generations before us have died. The generations to come will die. But God's word will last forever. The grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. The word of God will stand forever. That's Isaiah. 800 years before Christ. This is Christ. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For surely I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Or if you learn the King James, not a jot or tittle will pass away. Remember those writings, that writing from Revelation for today? Just two brief verses from Revelation 14. The eternal gospel of the Lord. It is eternally true. For it was true in the past. It is true for us today and it will be true for the future. It is the true promise that God's people, as we take that word, that we are reveal, that is, what is revealed to us is God's plan of salvation, God's plan for our lives and his guidance for our lives. And that is truly why we celebrate the Reformation this day. It's because when Luther translated God's word, it became available for all people. It became available for the common person. For each person, so even a person on the street who'd never been in the church before, much more unlikely than is that today, but even if they were to open it, that they could read it and read the truth. And that is why we celebrate the Reformation. It's because we know that the Holy Spirit, as it worked for, through Luther so long ago, continues to work not only through clergy today, through pastors today, but he continues to work to confront those false teachers in the world, to confront them with the truth. I encourage you to not only know God's Word exists, but to read it, to memorize it, to memorize the truths for you, to hunger and thirst. As Luther hunger and thirst, hungered and thirsted for the truth, for as he read it, it brought about the promise that although all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we have been justified freely in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Most gracious Lord, we thank you that you are our unchanging God. That as the author of Hebrews says, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us also know that the truth of your God, of your word, is unchanging. That is, as it is inspired by you, as it is breathed by you. That it is true just as much today as it was true for the people of old. That the promises in there are true for us. And it is the promise of salvation. Help us cling to those promises. Help us hold to them. Help us to know 
that it is your truth throughout all eternity. We thank you, O Lord, for sending your spirit to be our guide, that as we read your word, as we learn from your word, that we are able to grow in our faith, for we know that is the working of the spirit. In all things, we pray in the name of our Savior, our Lord, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Amen.